engagement strategy. In 2015, Toby launched Volunteer Pro, an online learning and networking community for leaders of volunteers. All the way from Knoxville, Tennessee, please welcome Toby Johnson. Good morning. Oh, Lord, we can do better than that, yeah? <laughs> whatever, stay, whatever happens in Canberra stays in Canberra, right? So who was out late last night? Oh, no one's going to admit. Oh, I see how you are. Okay, let's try it one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we are meeting. I, I just really think that's so lovely to start out um, talks that way. So... I wanted to take on your tradition, so thank you. Um, today I'm going to talk about trends. And uh, last year I was invited to write a book chapter for a book called Volunteer Engagement 2.0. It was put together by an organization called Volunteer Match in the US, and they match volunteers with organizations. I think we have something similar here in, the, in Australia. And the editor told me, I'd like you to speak on the, or I'd like you to write on these four topics, and he gave me some ideas. Uh, and so I had the, the luxury, really the luxury, because I had a little bit of a lull in my workload, which is not common, but I did. I had two weeks to sit on my deck in the sun and research and think and write. And it's so rare to have that opportunity in your life. And I was so grateful for it. And it's allowed me to share the gift of this thinking because I think uh, when we do talks, we're giving you gifts. And so today I want to give you the gift of perhaps some insight and different ways of thinking about where we're at in the world in society and how that might affect volunteerism, okay? So I might have some wild ideas, I might not. You see, you tell me what you think. So. Okay, so these are the four trends. Technology is changing consumer expectations. And volunteers are consumers. They're consumers of an experience. They are uh, involved in serious leisure, and they have expectations, and technology is changing those expectations. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. There's also been advances in brain science and psychology, deeper understanding about psychology that can help us lead volunteers more effectively. I think it's very interesting. There's trends in uh, the business world around talent management and the way that we uh, develop and lead talent and acquire talent. And I think there's something we can learn there as a volunteer sector. And then fourth, there's a lot of discussion about generations. And so I went ahead and did some pretty deep research about generations in the workplace and whether or not our thinking is evidence-based right now. And it may surprise you what I have to say. So let's get going. First of all, Volunteer trends. The reason I wanted to look into these things because there's some troubling trends in volunteerism. In the US, our US nonprofits have risen by about 21%, the number of nonprofits in the last decade or so. That's a large growth in the sector. Um, my goodness, my phone is making noise. Can't have that. Um, but we also have a decline in the volunteer rate by 3.5%. Very interesting. In, the, in Australia as well, rates are dropping as well. 31% volunteer compared to 36% just four years ago. Now, these are mega data, right? This is big data. It doesn't tell us about individuals. It tells us about trends. Um, but it's interesting nonetheless. What about episodic volunteers? Usually when I start talking about these data, people ask me, well, maybe volunteering is changing, and the numbers aren't reflecting that. And so I looked into episodic volunteers. Now, there is some issue with this research of episodic volunteering. The definitions aren't well agreed upon within the research field, within academia. When people are completing Bureau of Labor Statistics or census surveys, episodic volunteering is not really, or informal volunteering is not really described well. So we think that people may be underreporting. So there's a lot of issues with understanding these data. Now, you saw some data yesterday about episodic volunteering. That's starting to move the ball down the court and starting to be able to understand it better. But there are still issues with that, that information. So I looked at US annual volunteer hours, and those are dropping as well. 
So the annual volunteer hours have dropped from 37 to 32 percent in the last decade. 36.29% participate in groups or organizations, however. So we are still participating uh, in our communities. And 62.5% in, engage in informal volunteering. So we do have some data about how things are changing. But is, the fa is there something going on where volunteers are leaving traditional organizations and doing their own thing? Possibly. In the U.S., we're seeing an increase in civic participation, help neighbors helping neighbors, and a decrease in that form of volunteering. That's a little bit troubling to me, because I don't want all my, all, because when volunteers partner with us as organizations, we can do more together. Uh, we have the infrastructure. Volunteers have the talent. So in, in informing and informal volunteering in Australia, I took a look at that as well. Uh, in 2010, 20% provided care to someone with a disability, long-term illness, or issues related to aging. So people are helping people, not necessarily even family members always. And then 49% provided informal assistance to people not living in the same household. So we are a giving people, are we not? I think around the world we're a giving people, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that again, uh, as well. The other thing I looked at was really fascinating. My husband said to me, well, have you looked at the Ngram? And I'm like, what, the Ngram? What's that? I don't know what that is. He says, it's Google's tracking of book titles over history. And I said, ooh, cool. Well, whatever the Google says, we'll have to see what the Google says. So I checked out some words. I checked out nonprofit. Look at the increase in books on nonprofit. Now, you know booksellers are in the business of selling books, right? They're not going to sell titles that people won't buy. So this is sort of a proxy for the interest of people in the community and people uh, who buy books. I also looked at philanthropy and volunteering, and you can see that philanthropy took a bit of a dip. Volunteering, however, has been slowly but surely gaining popularity in terms of book titles. So I found that really interesting. Now, I also looked at volunteerism. You can see at the very bottom, that's not really, uh, it's slowly, but it's a very small amount of data. So. The million dollar question for us though is what is driving these shifts in volunteering? So I hear a lot of theories about this. I hear, well, volunteers are too busy. I hear, well, maybe our organizations aren't doing well in our volunteer management practices. I hear uh, people are too busy looking at phones. I hear the millennials don't care about non nonprofit or don't want to do social work. I, I see, I hear all kinds of reasons why. So I wanted to look into it and come up with some reasons of my own. And these are not research-based. This is based on, well, my, my review of literature, but just some of my ideas and some of my observations and reading of people who write about future, so the futurists. I looked a lot at people who write about uh, future, the future. P Faith Popcorn, for one, is a fantastic person to read about the future. So let's talk about technology for a minute. Evolution or revolution? If you think about it, how many people remember the princess phone? We're all gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna give our age away here. The princess phone had a long cord. It was analog. You could get the phone call only when the phone call came. When I was in college, we had a phone that had about 20 foot long cord. And if you wanted to have a private conversation, you had to take the phone and the cord down the hallway to your room, go in your room and shut the door. And when I was a teenager, similarly, if I didn't want my mom to hear what I was saying, I had to take it into the room. We had to have a long cord. So that's really different than what's going on now, which is smartphone usage. We all have personal computers. But now we're moving in, and I just changed this slide because in the last seven years, things have been moving so fastly, so rapidly, that now we have phones that not only give us information that we ask for, but they listen to us. And they give us biofeedback. I have an Apple Watch. It tells me how much I exercise every day. It's not perfect yet, but it will be. At some point, technology will be able to read. They're starting to do work on laptops where laptops are able to read with a camera your emotions. And technology will tell you, know, Toby, you're looking a little sad today. Should I play your favorite song for you? <laughs> yes. And now they're having robots that they're using robots for palliative care with older people. And those robots are empathetic. And those people are feeling the empathy of a robot. It is very interesting, 
kind of scary, but it's where we're headed. In five or 10 years, we will have robots. They will be here. And so things are happening really, really quickly. We're moving from a very limited world to a limitless world. And that's changing expectations. We also have an on-demand world. 64% of US adults own a smartphone, 89% of Australians. Most of you have a smartphone. Most of you expect information when you want it, how you want it. Nearly three quarters of smartphone users keep them within five feet at all times, including sleeping, including sleeping. And 40% look at their smartphone within five minutes of waking and 90% within one hour. We are connected. These are our digital appendages. And you're thinking, well, who cares? Well, here's what's happening. And the theorists and the academics are starting to talk about we are becoming cyborgs. And this may seem really far out and really futuristic, but think about it this way. Tools in the history of humankind, tools were an extension of the physical self. Tools helped us get things done, hammer on rocks, make fire, create a wheel to carry things. But tools are now an extension of the mental self. We now have an alternate reality we go to when we're on our phones. So now we're forced to have a second self that we maintain. We now maintain a digital second self, especially whether it's email, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Twitter. We're presenting ourselves to our, our closest loved ones as a certain self. We're also responsible now for presenting ourselves as a second self. And that's creating stress and anxiety for people. It's a lot more to pay attention to. A lot more to pay attention to. So, and I talked about, it's only a matter of time before our smartphones will be able to sense and our Apple watches will be able to sense what we're feeling. And we'll start to deliver information and support to help us with our emotional well-being. Interesting, again, kind of scary. But it's affecting things. So here's the connectivity paradox, though. We can be in love with technology, we can hate it. But the more we're connected digitally, the more disconnected we feel at a human level. There's been lots of research on the connectivity. There's a sense of ambient int intimacy, that we have intimacy, but it only happens in little spurts, when we get a text from somebody, or when we look at an email, and it comes and goes, but it interrupts our day as we go throughout our day. We also have the sense of being alone together. How many people have been around the family dinner table or at a dinner at someone else's house where every single head is bent over a screen? Anybody? I was at my, my husband's, my in-law's house for my niece's birthday. And we all decided, we were, drove up from Knoxville to Washington, D.C. and came to visit and celebrate her birthday. And at the end of that dinner, when it was birthday cake time and we were finishing up dinner, every single person, grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, sister, except for the birthday girl, had their face over a phone. And I nearly broke out in tears as I thought, this young lady, she's 12 years old, she deserves all the attention away from the phone and on her. And my husband and I, when we got married, I set the law, we got married about five years ago, and he made sure I got an iPhone right away. He's like, stop with that flip phone. You need to get with the, the system. And so we have rules about that, and we have to start having digital hygiene. We have to start thinking about digital hygiene. So we have this sense of being alone together. We're not, we, have to, we have technology to connect, but we're not feeling together. We also have selective attention. It's hard, and I know sometimes when I'm in a session, I'm taking pictures and tweeting, and people think I'm not paying attention, but I'm actually tweeting. I'm actually doing work related to the session I'm in. But there's a lot of time our human brain cannot pay attention to two things at once. So what does that all equal? A lack of focus and introspection as a human race. We're starting to have a lack of focus and introspect, introspection. We're actually starting to have lower attention spans. That's been documented as well. So the next frontier is virtual reality and augmented reality. Augmented reality is seeing 3D in front of you. Virtual reality is actually seeing a whole new world. And pretty soon, you know, uh, Facebook has already invested in Oculus Rift, which is that tool right there. Uh, Microsoft, my brother-in-law works at Microsoft in Seattle, has worked there practically his whole career, and he is 
was telling me that they just are releasing their uh, augmented reality headset and to use with Minecraft, which is a video game. I don't really do video games, but I'm like, okay, that's gonna change our reality and expectations as well and our sense of self. It's deep stuff. It is very deep stuff. So how's that affecting us? Now let me switch gears a minute for ra to bra brain science because I think this offers us some maybe possibly uh, solutions to some of this anxiety and pulling apart that technology is bringing. With all its good, it's also bringing some challenges for us. If you think about it, we have not been, we've only been using smartphones for about seven or eight years, and most of us haven't had them, maybe we've had them for four years. It is a complete revolution in who we are as human beings and how we see ourselves, and it can't be discounted. So the good news is some things remain the same about who we are as human beings. We know that we have a compassionate instinct. There's a, a, a researcher named Dr. Keltner. You can see his TED talk on compassionate instinct. He's done a lot of research on the human urge to help one another. It's very ingrained in who we are, in our DNA. We would not have survived as a species until now if we had not cooperated with one another and cared for one another. We just wouldn't have, we wouldn't have made it this far. So we know that giving rewards the, uh, rewards, um, uh, activates the brain's reward center. So oxytocin starts happening when we give. Whether we're giving cash or giving time, it feels really good. Talk to volunteers, or if you volunteer yourself, it feels fantastic to help somebody. Uh, we also know we can recognize compassion in the human voice. They've done studies where you have someone on the opposite side of the wall, they can actually recognize compassion in the voice. We are highly attuned to it. Compassion can be taught. We know that children can be taught compassion. It's how we learn. We don't just spring out of the womb compassionate. We actually learn from our parents and others. And compassion is viral, turning from self-interest to collaboration. If you think about it, have you ever seen those, heard of those pay it forward, somebody's going through? In the US, we, ha we are obsessed with drive-through coffee. Like Starbucks, we are obsessed. It's ridiculous. It's sort of like, how, how much faster do you need to drink coffee? But they've done these uh, studies and, and studied these phenomena where someone will say, hey, I'm giving you extra money and I want you to pay it forward. I want to pay, buy the person behind me in lines coffee. And it goes on for a really long time. We pick up on what others are doing around us and we mimic them. And so when volunteering becomes something very public, others want to, uh, it goes viral and others want to help as well. So it's important that we really raise the profile of volunteering and that everyone knows when volunteering is happening, okay? It's very, very. Uh, Dr. Keltner asserts that compassion and benevolence are an evolved part of human nature, rooted in our brain and biology, and ready to be cultivated for the greater good. This is not gonna change about who we are. Technology will, our compassionate instinct will not. It is very, very rooted in who we are, which is good news for us. So when I look at our psychology, there's some really cool models out there of looking at how to lead and collaborate with others. And because uh, we are instinctual, and most of our behavior is actually rooted in our instinctual old brain versus our, our rational new brain. Most of our, we actually make decisions based on our emotions first, and then we rationalize with the front part of our brain. So it's very interesting. I've been looking at different leadership models, and this one is the one that I think is very interesting, the SCARF neural leadership model. And I've talked about it uh, in other talks. So SCARF is something that was uh, put together by um, David Rock and the Neural Leadership Institute. They do a streaming conference every year online. It's fantastic to watch because you get to learn from neuroscientists and human resources professionals, etc. So he says that there's actually, uh, it's actually, we can use brain science to better understand how to motivate, influence, and lead others. And they're arguing that minimizing danger and maximizing reward is the key organizing principle of the brain. So we move towards things that we feel are rewarding us and we back away from things that we feel we have fear, that fight or flight instinct. So what happens there? In terms of leadership, you can see status, 
If we have, if we know the relative important, our own relative importance to other people, we feel more comfortable. Certainty. If we're able to know and predict the future in some way, we're more comfortable and want to move towards something. If we have a sense of control over events, if we have autonomy, we want to move forward. If we have relatedness and safety with others, we want to move forward towards that. We don't want to move away from it. And when we feel there's fair exchanges between people, we are more likely to be involved. This is fascinating stuff. Think about your volunteers in the, in, when they're onboarding with your organization, when they're just starting as newcomers. Believe it or not, newcomers, think about your first job or your, with the most recent job you joined. You experience a mix of emotions, whether you admit it or not. Remember your first week on the job, how exhausted you were every time you came home from work? The first week is exhausting. It's because your brain is processing overtime to figure out what's going on. You're, and you're also processing a myriad of conflicting emotions. Surprise, anticipation, joy, fear, ambiguity. What's going on? How do I act? What clothes do I wear? How do people talk here? What are the unwritten rules, right? Our volunteers are going through this every time they onboard with a new organization. Now, it may be more or less degree, more or less intense, but it's there. So how could we use SCARF, that SCARF neural leadership model in the onboarding process? In terms of safety, uh, we could use rituals that volunteers can predict that, yes, when we, we come on board, this is exactly what happens every day I come into the office or every day I come to my shift. We have specific rituals. We have meetings and we run our meetings in a certain way. So giving volunteers a certain sense of safety around rituals, and rituals I think can be very, very powerful for organizations. Relationships, doing team building. Some people think team building is just, oh yeah, if we have a conflict with volunteers, we probably should do some team building activity. Or what, you know, actually that social chit chat and just getting together is how we break down walls and build trust as human beings. It's an essential part of how we, how we trust and learn to trust. So relationships, promoting relationships, promoting relationships between volunteers, setting up buddy systems. Training, training increases self-confidence, helps connect the dots and provides a roadmap for organizational socialization if it's done correctly. So get, helping people learn, just making those unwritten rules really obvious. And then a cost-benefit analysis, letting volunteers know that they have a true purpose and that purpose has an impact. So telling them, in, telling them about what they're going to be able to achieve and helping them understand that it's worth it, that this stress that they're going through as they onboard is worth it. I used to have a program where volunteers went through 35 hours of training. It's very intensive, very difficult job they were learning how to do. And we would lose at least 50% after the training. And they would not go on to do, uh, to get plugged in and help us and ha get assigned and appointed. That was really sad. And now when I look at SCARF, I think, oop, I should have been wor worrying about SCARF. I should have been helping people onboard more. Let's switch gears and talk about talent management for a minute. I think talent management also offers us. In the business world, talent management has been building momentum. It's a little bit flattened out recently, but in the last maybe 10 years, but it's got some really interesting things to offer us. So, in, um, SHRM is an international organization, it's Association of Human Resources Professionals, and they do some research around um, human re all kinds of human resources issues. And they found that 47% of, uh, in a SHRM 2010 poll, said their top investment challenge for leaders in, in uh, businesses was finding human capital and maximizing their human capital investment. Doesn't that kind of sound, we use different words in the nonprofit sector and in the volunteer sector, but doesn't that kind of sound like what we do? I mean, maximizing talent, making sure people are set with the right jobs and doing the right thing. So recruiting and holding on to the best talent and getting the most out of people is critical. That's what they felt. And I thought, well, you know what? That's a lot like what we try to do. So strategic talent management is getting the right people with the right skills into the right jobs. I'm like, yeah, it's exactly what we do. So talent management was a response to the knowledge economy. What they were finding was people weren't being maximized. Their skill sets weren't being maximized. And they were having a lot of churn in the business world, and they really weren't achieving results with their talent. Human resources used to be just about compliance, getting paperwork done, and we heard that theme here at the conference this week, didn't we? 
I heard at one session, I remember, is it about paperwork or is it about people? Talent management errs on the people side versus the paperwork side. So human resources, the most uh, progressive human resources professionals are pivoting from that compliance and risk management, although risk management is still important, to the people side of things and aligning people with results. So it's very interesting. They're also moving from having talent management owned by a single department and human resources owned by a single department to moving out and being owned by everyone. So if you're a person who is uh, recruiting and training and placing either insourcing or outsourcing volunteers, you know what I'm talking about. You need those employees and those coworkers and those volunteer leaders to work right alongside you to support those volunteers as they get placed, yes? Yes, okay. So, and it's also focused on business goals. So when I think about talent management for volunteer organizations, things are a little bit different because volunteer, volunteers' greatest aspiration is to change the world. And in the nonprofit environment, the volunteer needs and preferences are as important as the organizations. When there's a true partnership and it's 50-50, community change can happen on a massive level. And so when we think about talent management with volunteers, it's not only about organizational needs, it also has an aspirational element to it, in my mind. And so when I think about volunteer talent management, I think about effectively matching volunteer skills and preferences with tasks that advance the organizational goals and mission and supporting volunteers so that they can take personal risks and emerge victorious. It's all about emerging victorious. It's all about reaching success. And for volunteers, what is success? Having an impact in the community. That's when they feel they're victorious. And so I think talent management may have some offers for us. When we think about integrated talent management all around the volunteer life cycle, look at what we have. We have workforce planning. And some of this we already do, but this is actually aligning it even further. So competency modeling, figuring out what competences are we actually looking for and which are we going to support for getting certain things done in our organizations. Um, and you can see placement consulting, coaching and mentoring, performance management. Are we really getting the job done? And this is side by side, shoulder to shoulder in partnership with volunteers. It's not management, top down command and control. It's collaborative. And then are the volunteers and the organization making impact? And then starting, and this is informed by strategic priorities of the organization and your data analysis. So it's very interesting to think how we can turbocharge our volunteer management through an integrated talent management approach. It's subtle, it's an interesting shift and it's subtle, but I think it has possibilities. Now, I said I would talk about generations for a minute, and I went ahead and did the research. So, we hear a lot about generations, and we hear a lot about changing our interventions with volunteers from different generations. Is there a difference between what motivates people in the workplace based on their generational affiliation? That was my question when I started to do the literature review. Because I heard a lot about it. Millennials want this, and boomers want this, and I, you know, I started to suspect things. It just seemed too pat, dry, pat and dried for me. And so I looked at the literature, and here's what I found. Research has been unable to support any fundamental and systemic differences between generations and their attitudes to, uh, towards work. Let me say that one more time, and I'm going to say it really close. Research has been unable <laughs> to demonstrate that there are any differences in terms of our attitudes for work. And when I say that, I mean intent to leave what satisfies people and motivates people in the workplace, those kinds of things are, there is no difference in terms of generational affiliation. Now people are probably going, no way, no way, Toby. Well, look at my resources at the bottom of the page, go out and look at these meta studies. These studies looked at, now, they're not, the, their work uh, employee, or no, they're not volunteers, they're employees, but we know from research that human motivation is the same 
verse, whether it's in a workplace or in a volunteer environment, more or less, we are motivated by intrinsic motivators, not extrinsic. When they do employee studies, they know that employees are not, their primary motivation is not dollars and cents. It's something else. And so this includes meaningful differences between job satisfaction, organizational commitment, intent to leave, based on generational membership. So if anybody tells you that millennials are fickle and they don't stick around for the job, et cetera, et cetera, it's a stereotype, okay? So that said, there are differences as we age, clearly. There's some of us are younger, we're digital natives. Some of us had to learn how to use a computer. When I wrote my master's thesis, I bought a Macintosh, it's a little tiny box. It's the first time most of my graduate papers were written on a typewriter. Yes, I am that old. So, we, younger people are more racially diverse. Younger people have higher levels of student loan debt, especially in the US, we have terrible student loan debt. Poverty and unemployment. I talked about digital na natives. Younger people feel more detached from institutions. They're more individualized. They're less likely to marry. They have higher expectations of career advancement and work-life balance, and I say, good for them. As a person who has a really hard time with work-life balance, good for them. They have higher job turnover, but that's not because of their intent to stay. That's because of the economy and where they're at in the pecking order in an, in an employer's workforce. And then they want the freedom to create and learn new skills. It's very important to them. That makes sense, doesn't it? When you're younger and you get out of school, you're all about getting more experience, right? Well, let's look at older people. Older people are shown to be dr more drawn to positivity. That was surprising to me. I was like, really? That's cool. They are delaying retirement now. Many older people are delaying retirement because it's just too darn expensive. There's a lag in the adoption of new technology. This is a no-brainer, right? But my mother is 72 years old. She is dyslexic, and she posts on Facebook every single day. She has been... I've, done a few Facebook posts. I don't p Facebook post a lot. Usually when I'm traveling, it's how I keep in touch with family. She reposts all of my stuff. It doesn't matter what it is, she reposts it. So she's amazing in terms of her use of technology. Should she do it perfectly? Does she know the social mores of Facebook very well? Not really, but that's okay. That's another story, right? So uh, older people prefer established relationships over new ones. That's kind of a no-brainer. Less likely to leave jobs, uh, again, because they're kept on sense of being needed, helpful, valued is important. And so when, with older people, they need to feel like they are valued and needed for who they are in their experience. And psychological contracts, those unspoken expectations they have are vitally important. And when they feel like the psychological contract is broken, they're out of there. And I can tell you as a woman who's going through menopause, it's amazing how the psychological contracts come into play because you're just like, nope, not doing it, out of here. So it's amazing what happens when you get older with psychological contracts. There's a certain freedom that happens. It's fabulous. Okay, so what are the values for all uh, generations? These are values for anybody. It doesn't matter, young or old, millennial boomer, X, Y. My husband just told me there's a new generation that they've labeled between Gen X and Boomer, because every time I look at those, I'm like, I, signs of the Zodiac, I don't understand. I don't fit into either. And he said, guess what? They've just found a new one. It's the, it's the uh, MTV generation, and we're it. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, okay, I understand that. You know, it's so funny. It's like signs of the Zodiac. But these are personal characteristics. Uh, having confidence, having occupation and challenge offered. Having communication and shared power, that's important to everybody. It doesn't matter what your generation. Continuing job stability, autonomy, recognition, those are all drivers of commitment and satisfaction. It doesn't matter, old, young, millennial, X, Y, Z, Q, P, whatever. It doesn't matter. And so, in reality, generational affiliation if you're going to use that as your intervention to improve engagement in your volunteer program, you're probably going to find that it doesn't work that well. However, if you keep old versus young in mind, it might help you in terms of engaging volunteers, recognizing and appreciating volunteers. Today's millennials will be tomorrow's boomers. That's how it's going to be. And I know there's doing a debate today or tomorrow about generations. So, 
Um, I'm happy to share with people some of my research, and if they want to get copies of these, if you email me, I'll send you these studies. They're fascinating, because I had to find out, I kept hearing this talk about generations, and I had to find out, is this really true, or is it a myth that we're perpetuating that just pigeonholes people? And I think, at, in the end, we are compassionate human beings because that is in our DNA and it's always gonna be in our DNA. So what we have to do as organizations is make it worth volunteers' time. They're busy people, they're distracted by technology. We're in a time where people are having a very difficult time figuring out how technology really works in our lives. I think in 10 or 20 years, we'll have more clear social mores about technology use, and the robots will be helping us. Mm -hmm. So. Think about it this way. In closing, I have a few more slides. For volunteers to spend their time, the experience must be worth their time. So we have to be architects of experience, and I talked about this on the panel yesterday. So I'm gonna give you some quick, really quick, short takeaways, because usually when I do this talk, people say, all right, you know, volunteer managers are very practical. They're like, great, these ideas are really big and whatever, but what do we do? Tell us what to do. So I'm gonna tell you a few things that I think. Align with the technology habits of tomorrow's volunteers. So keep your eye on the prize. As technology changes, you're going to need to evolve with it. You're going to need to have either volunteers who know technology or staff that know technology. You need to invest in it because it's here to stay. Um, presenting volunteering as a lifestyle. Volunteering is about, in part, expressing values and beliefs, and more and more, we are becoming that type of lifestyle of people. We are expressing what we choose to eat, buy, drink, where we shop, who we affiliate with, is ex an expression of our values and belief sets. Why do you think corporate social responsibility is on the rise? Employee volunteering, anybody? It's about expressing values and belief, and it's about corporations building their brand about, around our lifestyles, and what we believe in. So, and tapping fear of missing out. It's a great way to get people, FOMO it's called, fear of missing out, okay? Acknowledge and share power. We are no longer in a top-down command and control world. Anybody who manages that way is probably not getting traction at this point. So in order to tap and share power, it means we have to have those type of skills. Consensus decision making, true power sharing, alternate decision making structures, alternate governance structures. We need to start to learn those skills. I train a lot of volunteers on these types of skills. Consensus, even older volunteers don't have, even volunteers who grew up in the 60s and worked with consensus um, actually have difficulty with that. So we all have to build these skills and with technology, it's not helping us collaborate. It's getting, uh, it's making it harder for us to collaborate in some extent. And then working with human nature, not against it. Yesterday, I did a whole workshop on non-sales selling, how to influence others. Some of you were there. We had a really good time. Um, and then I have a few more. Borrow from community organizing. If you've ever worked with community organizers and activists and using the snowflake model, it is a fantastic model for leadership development and expanding your mission throughout what you can do with a smaller team and creating that mission uh, in your community and community wide. wide. Challenging legacy mindsets, like I challenge that generational mindset and those stereotypes. Uh, stop looking for the silver bullet. It's not there. This is, this is a complex time we live in, and we're just going to have to deal with it. But if we work side by side with our volunteers, we can figure it out. And then take volunteerism seriously as a human resources strategy. And when you start to talk to your higher-ups in your organizations about volunteerism as a human, a chosen human resource strategy to meet mission in your communities, that starts to sound a little bit different. And when you start to p position yourself as the talent management expert and consultant in your organization, things start to change. And when you start to build that skill set, it's amazing what can happen. So finally, if you want to read more about this talk and what I talk about in this talk, this book, I don't make any money off this book. I volunteered my time to write the chapter. I'm chapter one, and I talk, talk in more detail about these trends. 
And then finally, I just want to say thank you for having me. It's been my first international conference, actually. And I love, I've had a really good time here in Australia. And I will, if you want to talk to me more, I'll be at the um, networking lounge this afternoon at lunchtime. Thank you.